On the shore of Chicago's Lake Michigan, the President of the United States dedicates the newest link in Chicago's famed Outer Drive. Partly built by a federal grant, the link is a 355-foot double-leaf bridge joining the north and south drives and giving Chicago a continuous waterfront of long green park on the fringe of the Blue Lake. Surrounded by bunting and banners, faced by a sizable crowd, the President stops briefly on the last homeward leg of his two-week Western inspection tour to dedicate this newest step forward in Chicago's impressive lakefront. Celebrating the 100th anniversary of the city's corporation, Chicagoans wander through crowded streets this morning in costumes of earlier days, many gallon hats, buckskin shirts, even the feathers and paint of redskin Indians are touched by this 1937 sun breaking through the mists overhead as balloons and homing pigeons add the last touch of festivity to the day. In this typically restless American setting, the president is now introduced by the Honorable Edward J. Kelly, the mayor of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Kelly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary of the Interior, Senator Dietrich, Governor Horner, distinguished guests and friends, we are in the closing weeks of Chicago's Charter Jubilee celebration. We are looking back on a century of building and civic improvement. We are looking forward to a new century of growth. The ceremonies here today are in striking contrast to the state of warfare over bridges, which prevailed in Chicago 100 years ago. We rejoice today over the welding of a vital new link between the north and south sides of Chicago. It seems to us unbelievable that there could have been a time in the history of Chicago when bridges were not wanted. Yet in 1839, a mob of angry citizens chopped down the Dearborn Street drawbridge, destroying the connection between the two sides of the city. Commercial competition led to this act of violence, but the passing of years brought new conceptions of neighborly cooperation. Today, the city is unselfishly won. Chicago, the city of the broad shoulders and big heart, has finished another job. The struggles, the years of work and planning, the boundless energy and courage of Chicago's builders to complete the longest bascule bridge in the world is a thrilling record of cooperation and conquest. The watchword of Chicago civic planners was, it can be done. Today, Chicago reports to the world, it is done. We are witnessing today something greater than a lasting triumph in stone and steel. In all this drama and human enterprise, there is a heart-stirring opera of civic devotion and planning. There is a grateful hymn of praise for Chicago's pioneers. There's a marching song of a friendly city's comradeship and united purpose. And in this hour of accomplishment, what greater honor could come to the city of good neighbors than to be blessed with the presence of the nation's first good neighbor. And here in Chicago, which is now the traffic center of the world, where the Potawatomi Indians 100 years ago stopped in their passage along the shores of Lake Michigan which was then a barren swamp. Even within our memory, watching the skyscrapers rise and the boulevards spread, we can recall the tin can and rubbish dumping ground that is now the beautiful Grant Park. Something must be said for the Daniel Burnhams, the Edward Wackers, the Montgomery Wards, and the James Simpsons, who had the vision and foresight to plan for Chicago's future. The only yardstick which can measure this accomplishment lies in the question, who benefits from it all? Who enjoys all, all the opportunity for pleasure and cultural advancement? Our dreams and hopes have been translated into this great commons of Chicago, this vast meeting place of a city and its guests, of which this bridge is a very important part, where millions came for entertainment and recreation, as well as for enlightenment, to band concerts, athletic and water sports, museums, and various other things. And with the same quickening pulse, all kindled by the same desire to promote Chicago's betterment. And in the same gay mood of friendliness, and all sharing the same emotions of tolerance and goodwill and fair dealing. It really represents and value to the Chicago citizens at a considerably much less cost. As president of the South Park Board, and now as mayor of Chicago, I am proud that I have been identified with this opportunity to unite and advance Chicago. The good neighbors of Chicago, Mr. President, as you know, can address themselves to any task and achieve it. 
whatever adds to our social and economic progress, are all summed up in our driving, resourceful spirit of I will. It is a typical American city where all races and creeds live in happy harmony, all vitally interested solely in American democracy. How open and free is all of Chicago with rejoicing in this celebration when we think of the turmoil and conflict that now grips other nations abroad. We are aware, Mr. President, that this whole accomplishment might have been postponed indefinitely were it not for your help. In your present journey throughout the nation, you have been taking an inventory of recovery. You have been putting your own finger on the pulse of public response to your helpful programs of providing work and permanent public improvements. The hundreds of thousands who greet you here have the same admiration for your humane and courageous leadership as have the many thousands you have met during your trip throughout the West. <clears throat> we would be amiss if we'd not at this particular time thank our secretary, Mr. Ickes, and also Administrator Harry L. Hopkins, who have done much to make this great bridge possible. Grateful indeed is every citizen in Chicago for the long-ranging planning and tireless work of President Dunham and his associates of the Chicago Park District, not only here, but in all parts of our city. Now, Mr. President, the symbol of dedication of this centennial bridge is found in a union of hearts as well as hands. It is a symbol of the gap you bridged between the nation's want and the nation's security, fear and the country's confidence. It is a symbol of the permanent link you forged between a nation standing still and a nation pulling out of the rough. We welcome you, Mr. President, and we express our heartiest gratitude for your help. This 30 miles of uninterrupted lakefront boulevards has widened this gateway of the Middle West. But in your final appraisement of this achievement today, may you take away the dominant thought and the prevailing hope of the people of Chicago, a better and more beautiful city, a city whose growing pains have not changed its warm heart and friendly spirit, a city that ran ahead of recovery and is still staying out in front. Now, I have never been more happy. The people of Chicago have never been more happy. And I've never been more thrilled than to welcome our friend and good neighbor, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Chicago. I am glad to come once again to Chicago, and especially to have the opportunity of taking part in the dedication of this important project of civic betterment. I congratulate Chicago and Cook County on the opening of this splendid bridge and of these 30 miles of Lakefront Boulevard. On my trip across the continent and back, I have been shown many evidences of the result of common sense cooperation between municipalities and the federal government. And I have been greeted by tens of thousands of Americans who have told me in every look and word that their material and spiritual well-being have made great strides forward in the past few years. 
And yet, as I have seen with my own eyes, the prosperous farms, the thriving factories, the busy railroads, as I have seen the happiness and security, and especially the peace that covers our wide land, almost inevitably, I have been compelled to contrast our peace with very different scenes that are being enacted in other parts of the world. It is because the people of the United States must, for the sake of their own future, give thought to the rest of the world that I, as the responsible executive head of the nation, have chosen this great inland city and this gala occasion to speak to you on a subject of definite national importance. The political situation in the world, which of late has been growing progressively worse, is such as to cause grave concern and anxiety to all the peoples and nations who wish to live in peace and amity with their neighbors. Some 15 years ago, the hopes of mankind for a continuing era of international peace were raised to great heights when more than 60 nations solemnly pledged them to resort to arms in furtherance of their national aims and policy. The high aspirations expressed in the Briand Kellogg Pact and the hopes for and the hopes for peace thus raised have of late given way to a haunting fear of calamity. The present reign of terror and international lawlessness began a few years ago. It began through unjustified interference in the internal affairs of other nations or the invasion of alien territory in violation of treaties. It has now reached the stage where the very foundations of civilization are seriously threatened. The landmarks, the traditions, which have marked the progress of civilization toward a condition of law and order and justice are being wiped away. Without a declaration of war and without warning or justification of any kind, Civilians, including vast numbers of women and children, are being ruthlessly murdered with bombs from the air. In times of so-called peace, ships are being attacked and sunk by submarines without cause or notice. Nations are fomenting and taking sides in civil warfare in nations that have never done them any harm. Nations claiming freedom for themselves do not deny it to others. Innocent peoples, innocent nations are being cruelly sacrificed to a greed for power and supremacy which is devoid of all sense of justice and humane consideration. To paraphrase a recent author, perhaps we foresee a time when men exultant in the technique of homicide will rage so hotly over the world that every precious thing will be in danger. Every book, every picture, every harmony, every treasure garnered through two millenniums the small, the delicate, the defenseless, all will be lost or wrecked or utterly destroyed. If those things come to pass in other parts of the world, let no one imagine that America will escape, that America may expect mercy, 
that this Western Hemisphere will not be attacked and that it will continue tranquilly and peacefully to carry on the ethics and the arts of civilization. No, if those days come, there will be no safety by arms, no help from authority, no answer in science. The storm will rage until every flower of culture is trampled and all human beings are leveled in a vast chaos. If those days are not to come to pass, if we are to have a world in which we can breathe freely and live in amity without fear, then the peace-loving nations must make a concerted effort to uphold laws and principles on which alone peace can rest secure, which today are creating a state of international anarchy, international instability, from which there is no escape through mere isolation or neutrality. Those who cherish their freedom and recognize and respect the equal rights of their neighbors to be free and live in peace, must work together for the triumph of law and moral principles in order that peace, justice, and confidence may prevail throughout the world. There must be a return to a belief in the pledged word in the value of a signed treaty. There must be recognition of the fact that national morality is as vital as private morality. <laughs> a bishop wrote to me the other day, it seems to me that something greatly needs to be said in behalf of ordinary humanity against the present practice of carrying the horrors of war to helpless civilians, especially women and children. It may be that such a protest may be regarded by many who claim to be realists as futile, but may it not be that the heart of mankind is so filled with horror at the present needless suffering that that force could be mobilized in sufficient volume to lessen such cruelty in the days ahead. Even though it may take 20 years, which God forbid, for civilization to make effective its corporate protest against this barbarism, surely strong voices may hasten the day. There is a solidarity, an interdependence about the modern world, both technically and morally, which makes it impossible for any nation completely to isolate itself from political and economic upheavals in the rest of the world, especially when such upheavals appear to be spreading and not declining. There can be no stability or peace, either within nations or between nations, except under laws and moral standards adhered to by all. International anarchy destroys every foundation for peace. It jeopardizes either the immediate or the future security of every nation, large or small. And it is therefore a matter of vital interest and concern to the people of the United States that the sanctity of international treaties and the maintenance of international morality be restored. The overwhelming majority of all the peoples and nations of the world today want to live in peace. They seek the removal of barriers against trade, they want to exert themselves in industry, in agriculture, in business, that they may increase their wealth 
through the production of wealth-producing goods rather than striving to produce military planes and bombs and machine guns and cannons for the destruction of human lives and useful property. In those nations of the world, which seem to be piling armament on armament for purposes of aggression, and those other nations which fear acts of aggression against them and their security, a very high proportion of their national income is being spent today directly for armament. It runs from 30 to as high as 50 percent in most of those cases. We are fortunate. The proportion that we spend in the United States is far less, 11 or 12 percent. How happy we are that the circumstances of the moment permit us to put our money into bridges and boulevards, dams and reforestation, the conservation of our soil, and many other kinds of useful works rather than into huge standing armies and vast supplies of implements of war. <laughs> Nevertheless, my friends, I am compelled and you are compelled to look ahead. The peace, the freedom, the security of 90% of the population of the world is being jeopardized by the remaining 10 percent who are threatening a breakdown of all international order and law. Surely the 90 percent who want to live in peace under law and in accordance with moral standards that have received almost universal acceptance through the centuries can and must find some way to make their will prevail. Yes, the situation is definitely of universal concern. The questions involved relate not merely to violations of specific provisions of particular treaties. They are questions of war and peace, of international law, and especially of principles of humanity. It is true that they involve definite violations of agreements and especially of the Covenant of the League of Nations, the Briand-Kellogg Pact, and the Nine Power Treaty. And we have signed both of the last two. But they involve also problems of world economy, world security, and world humanity. It is true that the moral consciousness of the world must recognize the importance of removing injustices and well-found grievances. But at the same time, it must be aroused to the cardinal necessity of honoring sanctity of treaties, of respecting the rights and the liberties of others, and of putting an end to acts of international aggression. It seems to be unfortunately true that the epidemic of world lawlessness is spreading. And mark this well. When an epidemic of physical disease starts to spread, the community approves and joins in a quarantine of the patients in order to protect the health of the community against the spread of the disease. It is my determination to pursue a policy of peace. It is my determination to adopt every practicable measure to avoid involvement in war. It ought to be inconceivable that in this modern era and in the face of experience, 
any nation could be so foolish and ruthless as to run the risk of plunging the whole world into war by invading and violating, in contravention of solemn treaties, the territory of other nations that have done them no real harm and which are too weak to protect themselves adequately. Yet the peace of the world and the welfare and security of every nation, including our own, is today being threatened by that very thing. No nation which refuses to exercise forbearance and to respect the freedom and the rights of others can long remain strong and retain the confidence and respect of other nations. No nation ever loses its dignity or its good standing by conciliating its differences and by exercising great patience, patience with and consideration for the rights of other nations. War is a contagion, whether it be declared or undeclared. It can engulf states and peoples remote from the original scene of hostilities. Yes, we are determined to keep out of war, yet we cannot insure ourselves against the disastrous effects of war and the dangers of involvement. We are adopting such measures as will minimize our risk of involvement, but we cannot have complete protection in a world of disorder in which confidence and security have broken down. If civilization is to survive, the principles of the Prince of Peace must be restored. Shattered trust between nations must be revived. Most important of all, the will for peace on the part of peace-loving nations must express itself to the end that nations that may be tempted to violate their agreements and the rights of others will desist from such a cause. There must be positive endeavors to preserve peace. America hates war. America... America hopes for peace. Therefore, America actively engages in the search for peace. So amidst the blast of steamboat whistles and the roar of circling airplane motors, the President of the United States dedicates Chicago's handsome new outer drive bridge leaving the city now to enjoy its 30-odd miles of now unbroken drive along the lake. The president motors to lunch at the home of his eminence, George Cardinal Mundelein, and then back to the Kent 10-car presidential special train and an overnight jump to Hyde Park, New York, with but one more speaking date left on the crowded two-week schedule, and that is tonight in Cleveland at 10.45 Eastern Standard Time. This is Bob Trout speaking to you from Chicago's Outer Drive Bridge and returning you now to our New York studios. We appreciate the courtesy of the makers of Lucky Strike Cigarettes, sponsors of Edwin C. Hill, in relinquishing their program in order for us to bring you the special broadcast that just ended. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WJSV Washington, D.C.